Um, so again, my name is Jessica Ferguson, and I'm the stewardship coordinator for the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. Joining me this evening is Donna Crossland, the HWA coordinator for the Medway Community Forest Co-op, and Tom Rogers of Giants of Nova Scotia. As a settler of this land, I would like to take a moment to recognize how privileged we are to work and live in Mi'kmaq, which is the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq. We give deep gratitude to the Mi'kmaq who have been the original caretakers of Mi'kmaq since time immemorial. While there is work to be done, the Nature Trust is working to build meaningful relationships grounded in respect, elevating Mi'kmaq rights and Mi'kmaq-led conservation, inclusive of the large-scale project that we'll be discussing tonight. I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. We're a charity, a not-for-profit community organization dedicated to protecting Nova Scotia's unique natural legacy. Our vision is a future in which Nova Scotia's native species, unique habitats and natural landscapes are protected in perpetuity and in which this natural leg legacy is appreciated and actively stewarded. Driven by robust conservation science, we focus our work on the most unique, rare and outstanding natural areas in the province. Protecting Nova Scotia's imperiled coastal ecosystems and island ecosystems, unspoiled lakes, rivers and wetlands, and towering old growth forests, as well as critical habitat for wildlife, including some of Canada's most endangered species. We were created in 1994 to address an urgent conservation challenge. Over 70% of Nova Scotia is privately owned and over 85% of our coast is in private hands, making it at risk for development. We preserve land through permanent conservation agreements, generous land donations and bequests. And in some cases, we fundraise to purchase land as well. The Nature Trust now conserves approximately 170 properties all across the province, over 20,000 acres of land protected in perpetuity. Saving land is just the beginning though. All our conservation lands are entrusted to our care and they become part of our land legacy that we hold in trust for all Nova Scotians. Our commitment is to protect those lands forever. Staff and hundreds of volunteers across the province help to steward and safeguard these natural areas through our Property Guardians program. Our conservation lands provide refuge not just for nature, but for people too. So we help preserve places where people love to hike, paddle, fish, birdwatch, and we ensure that future generations can enjoy these places too. We have active educational programs and events giving people opportunities to experience, explore, and learn about nature, and to take a hands-on role in stewarding the places that they care about. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to share our Nature Trust story with you. If you're interested in supporting our work further, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Just at the same email that you did to register for this webinar today. Uh, now I'm going to pass things over to Donna to teach us all about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. If you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, please feel free to just pop them in the Q&A box. Um, I may be able to address them as we go through, but we'll also discuss at the end. Um, and just so everyone is aware, if you're joining a little later, uh, we are um, recording this webinar. All right, so over to you, Donna. Well, thank you, Jessica, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with this group tonight. And I, I thank right away um, Tom Rogers for for helping to uh, shepherd all of the questions in the chat and uh, just to back me up if I get stuck. He's getting to be so knowledgeable on Hemlock Woolly Adelgid himself that uh, uh, he he's he's I'm going to lean on him tonight. So I, I'm just distracted here with just wanting to share my screen right away and sure. uh let's see if i get this stumbling block yeah. easy there it is there it is okay so just want to make sure we're off to the right start um still not on view show yet right so yeah, that's right. Um, it's always delayed. I think it's coming. Looks like it's, it's there. there yet? Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
Hang on, I think I know how to fix this. Uh, test, test. No, no, that's not good. <laughs> A little bit of echo. Drain. Okay, I'm going to have to unshare. No. Not. Um, the only thing I can suggest actually now is to, it's, it's the other, um, it's the other monitor that's, uh, coming on. Maybe if I just turn it off, that's, that should stop it. Okay. Let's try it again. It says I am still screen sharing. Am I still screen share sharing? Yes. How about now? Okay, no echo, and you see my screen. <laughs> Wonderful. We're in business. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everybody. Glad, glad folks can join tonight. Uh, there's probably some uh, people here uh, that are quite concerned. Maybe you already have hemlock woolly adelgid on a woodlot or uh, a favorite place uh, with hemlock growing on it. So I'm hoping that we can address some of your concerns tonight or give you some information that you're looking for because we're all in this together, sadly, with um, dealing with this invasive insect from Southern Japan. And um, it's, uh, it's just yet another emergency that we're dealing with in our forests in Nova Scotia. So I'm all about uh, conserving hemlock forests against HWA or hemlock woolly adelgid in Nova Scotia. And I've been working with HWA since uh, about 20, late in 2018, looking for it in Kejimkujik National Park and, and then beginning a big project that began in 2019 there. And since then leaving and going to the Midway Community Forest Co-op to help them uh, coordinate a project and which is ultimately helping the province um, protect uh, some of their most precious hemlock forests in protected areas. So without further ado, so I uh, thank you to Tom. I can't see him just the way I'm presenting this, but I know he's out there. So, so hemlock, eastern hemlock, we have to specify because there is a western hemlock on the west coast of Canada and the US, but eastern hemlock is considered by some to be the redwood of the east because it is the largest of our conifer trees. We have white pine that can grow the tallest, but in terms of girth and just sheer wood volume, hemlock can be the largest conifer in our eastern forests. And it also consists of most of our last old growth forests that we have, of which we have very little in Nova Scotia. And interestingly enough, the, the scientific name Suga canadensis, Suga in Japanese means mother. So we think of mother trees now with Dr. Suzanne Simar's work on the west coast of Canada. And I think it probably is no accident that we think of it as our mother tree because it is the tree that extends its protection to all that uh, live and work and play or just thrive under the shelter of, of the boughs of hemlock. Hemlock can live to be 450 years of age. And so it really is part of, and a very important part of our old growth forest. And when you go into a, an old growth hemlock stand, you can feel very dwarfed in size. And I'm just gonna point out that there's two little people standing there that aren't that little. I think one of them was Colin Gray from MTRI. So, um, but this is Pollard's Falls and it's just an amazing stand, but it's heavily infested right now. And so we were working very, as quickly as we could last fall, trying to uh, protect what we could. Some of these trees are now too far in decline to even treat. So this, this is very much um, an emergency, but getting back to the special qualities of hemlock, it's got very delicate, uh, almost lacy boughs. And, and so they're, they're very graceful. It's just an extremely graceful, conifer tree, it has the smallest foliage, the, the needles, they're, they're flat like balsam fir, but they're shorter than balsam fir and they have these little oval cones. So it's it's just 
it, there's something very graceful and aesthetically pleasing about an eastern hemlock tree. And of course, then there's these these thick boughs. When you get old growth hemlock, you can have very, very stout lateral boughs coming off the trunk. And these broken uh, boughs are, are um, that's just common. It's just the way hemlock grows. It typically has broken lower limbs on it. It just gives it that, that artistic look about it. So, uh, and I just point out that the protection it gives to wildlife and, and other forest components is, yeah, you know, it's got this broad canopy. And if you compare it to balsam fir or a, or a red spruce tree, you know, they have a conical shape. So, the, you know, hemlock has this broad canopy. So it's, it's quite, that's why, one of the reasons why it's, it's so important for wildlife habitat and, and, and providing shelter to wildlife. So here's a picture in winter. It's particularly important. It's like Mother Nature's barn. It, it those those thick canopies intercept the snowfall, and so you can expect the snow on the ground under hemlock forest to be half of the depth that you would find it outside a hemlock stand. And so that really facilitates wildlife uh, getting around under the shelter of hemlock. It also blocks the wind, and just you know if there's driving cold, freezing rains. You, you want to be under the protection of the canopy of hemlock. And of course, there are many uh, species that you find more frequently in hemlock stands, uh, like the American Martin and uh, Fisher as well, like the den in, at the base of hemlock. Uh, barred owls are commonly found in hemlock stands and, and uh, northern goshawks. Uh, they like to live in hemlock stands because they're a very large hawk and they'll soar in the under the canopy in between and because you have these open grown trees they can they can fly in amongst the tree trunks very easily when they're hunting and of course the endangered mainland moose likes hemlock because it's warmer it's shelter in the winter and it's it's so it's thermal cover, as we say, and then in the summer, it's a cool refuge as well. It can be up to four degrees cooler on a hot summer's day. And hemlock commonly line our lakes and our streams, and so it's an important riparian tree, and it protects particularly the steep banks of streams. And so if, if they were to all collapse, all to die at once, you'd have increased stream stream flashiness as you know the rains would be not intercepted by any living or large diameter tree trunk trunks so it would be a straight flush into the rivers so uh, i've been trying to convince a lot of people in my desperate plea to save as many hemlock as we can that it's cheaper to protect hemlocks in many instances uh, with chemical control which we'll get into in a minute than it is to rebuild the bridges and the flooded highways and flooded homes that will probably occur downstream in watersheds that have a lot of hemlock in them. So there's some important considerations there. But certainly hemlock is just so beautiful and so picturesque along a lot of our streams in Nova Scotia. And we're so, we're so fortunate to have so many uh, uh, rivers, beautiful rivers in Nova Scotia. And um, so the, the looming losses from from these these areas, looming losses of hemlocks along these beautiful places. It's it's um, it it's food for thought. That um, and I tell lots of people, pardon me, that hemlock forests will never look as beautiful as they do right now. And so I'd encourage everyone from the Nova Scotia Nature Trust that if they have a favorite favorite spot, or if they want to get to know hemlock better, now's the time because they're never going to look as nice as they do this year. And case in point, here's Sisabu Falls uh, in the southwest of Nova Scotia, Digby County. And when hemlocks start to die from hemlock woolly adelgid, and we'll, we'll uh, learn more about HWA in a minute, uh, they resemble gray ghosts. So you can pick out the hemlock in this photo because they're the gray or blue gray colorations there on this steep embankment just below the power dam at uh, Sisibu. And so, um, uh, and I, I'll just add right away that some people are thinking that, uh, well, there'll be some trees that are resistant to hemlock woolly adelgid and things will just be better soon. And, and we don't actually 
know of any HWA resistant hemlocks out there on the landscape just yet. There, there's a report of a bulletproof stand in New Jersey, uh, but science is still out as to whether or not they're really, as we say, bulletproof, and whether they really are resisting hemlock or they just happen to have some defenses up for some other reason and so we're, the research is still being uh, carried on but in any case um, we want to hold on to some of the old growth that we have right now and that can't be replaced by little tiny seedlings of purportedly resistant uh, trees. So um, yeah and if you're a trout fisherman or a salmon fisherman you think about uh, hemlock boughs over streams and how that's shading and cooling the water as well as as uh, regulating the flow of the streams and so uh, that will also be lost. So uh, protecting hemlocks is not just about protecting the terrestrial resources of these unique forests but it's also uh, extending protection to aquatic resources, aquatic health. Here's what it looks like uh, just last year at Pearl Lake in Tuscott. And so um, great ghosts, and you can pick out the, the spruce, the other tree species amongst the backdrop of, of these hemlocks that have just died. So it's happening, folks. It's, uh, you know, it. we want to be ostriches and stick our head in the sand and hope this isn't going to happen to us, but it is coming wherever there's hemlock in Nova Scotia. HWA will get there. And so we need to just be ready for, for this. So this constitutes old Eastern hemlock forest gone forever. It's the loss of not just the tree, but a loss of an ecosystem because hemlock forests make, they kind of make their own climate. They, they, they provide a unique ecosystem within the Wabanagi Acadian forest. And so if this tree dies, especially where there's almost pure stands of hemlock, there are going to be cascading effects and there will be habitat loss for many other species. And just to put it in a modern day, an even more modern day context, here's what uh, the satellite imagery looks like out of uh, New Maryland um, climate modeling, their global forest change. You can see uh, that the red all constitutes the where there was forest, and the satellites detected that there was forest and now there's no forest, that there's a forest cover loss. So everything in red is a forest cover loss that's occurred between the year 2000 and 2020, which is pretty riveting. This is all the forest cover loss that's happened in the last 20 years. So this is obviously the reflection of unsustainable forest harvesting practices, but now it's coupled with the loss of, of, of old growth hemlock forests dying as well. And just to point out, you can tell where the some of the protected areas are uh, in Nova Scotia, like Cape Breton Highlands National Park and Kejimkujik National Park and the Tobiatic Wilderness Area, because they're the black areas where there hasn't been any forest cover loss in the last 20 years or very, very little. So um, we're in a crisis, a climate crisis, because now all of those red areas on the map are actually emitting carbon instead of sequestering carbon from the excess greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so uh, I just don't want to think about then, you know, I, hemlock is the iconic tree of Kejimakujik. So down here in the black, this is, there's going to be some red areas probably where the hemlock dot. So uh, we're going from, uh, as we see on the left, uh, a healthy hemlock canopy to this on the right. This is a, a hemlock tree that I, a photo that I took in Bear River just a couple of months ago. In, um, and so the canopy is almost entirely lost there. So this is a permanent loss. It's not like um, hemlock's gonna grow back to uh, people think, oh, well, it's just like any other pest. It's not like, native pests. You know, we, we put a lot of effort in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick into um, the spruce budworm epidemic, and, and there's a lot of um, cries of alarm over this. Well, budworm is a native pest. Um, I don't even like to say pest because it's, it, if you're with the pulp and paper industry, then it's a pest, but it's also a naturally occurring, it's an insect. It's a part of our it's a natural component of the Wabanagi Acadian forest. And so there are birds that depend on consuming this 
this insect as it uh, rises up every 30, 40 years. Um, so, but HWA, when it comes along, it's a permanent loss of hemlock. It's never coming back. So hemlock is a forest giant on the edge. There's a couple of books written about it I put on the right that I actually really like, one by David Foster and one by Tim Palmer. And that can kind of, um, they're, they're a pretty good read if someone wants to look at more information. Uh, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> we're in trouble. And so um, what are we going to do about that? Well, let's learn a little bit more about the insect first before we dive in. So it's an invasive insect from Southern Japan. It was detected in Yarmouth County in 2017. And by that time it had already, we estimated it had probably been there for already 10 years or so. And it attacks only hemlock. So it's not going to eat other things as hemlock oleodelgin. And those little white sacks that you see in the picture are indeed little woolly adelgids. Um, the insect is, um, has got feeding stylets inserted into the, the woody tissue, the little fine twigs of the hemlock tree, and it's sucking sap. And as it grows, it secretes this white waxy wool, which gives it its name. There, um, it causes up to 95% mortality in the stand. I, you know, we could probably consider it 100% mortality, but you may have to wait for the last few dwindling hemlock to die. But there's, there's no there's no out with this once you get it. Um, uh, so we don't have any natural predators that control it. We know because it's just been running rampant since we've discovered it here. Uh, and so there may be some insects that are nibbling on it, but they really haven't developed an appetite for it yet. So, and we know that so far, hemlocks have no natural resistance that we found to HWA, but we certainly encourage all landowners that have hemlock to watch and see if maybe they've got the hemlock that's going to stay dark green and doesn't get infested with HWA. Maybe they have a, a, a tree that is resistant. So that's important to watch for. Um, really cold winter days uh, will kill a lot of hemlock woolly adelgid. And so we did have one cold snap this winter of just one night that it plunged down to minus 27 in most places. And there was over 90% mortality. We're still waiting for the exact figure from Jeff Fidgen at Canadian Forest Service. Uh, but, and, but also we lose adelgids in really hot, dry weather as well. Um, and we can lose adelgids when it's a really rainy summer. But basically nothing's stopping this pest. It might knock it back a bit, but it, it, keeps, it keeps on trucking. So we can't really hope for weather to, to slow this down a great deal in Nova Scotia where winters are getting more mild. And, and, and this adelgid spreads very easily on the wind for um, we think just short distances, but it can spread even further on the feathers and feet of birds that are gleaning insects from hemlock canopy and then also from just deer or squirrels or other animals. And, but the really true long leaps seem to be from us. We keep moving things around. And so we've got to be extra careful ourselves at slowing the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid. And we'll get into that more in a second, but here's the, the uh, range of HWA, at least in 2021, I didn't update the map yet, but the red area is where, you know, there were detections before 2021, and now it's moving into, well, the yellow areas where the new sightings and in 2021, and then the green is the whole full extent of hemlock. So this is where it's headed to next, basically. And uh, so on our screen, it, now you see uh, the regulated area for hemlock woolly adelgid in Nova Scotia, all of the pink areas. So it's in seven of the, south, of the southwestern counties now of Nova Scotia. So, and it's marching steadily more eastward. So the red dots are the positive observation sites. And the, by regulated area, I mean that we're not allowed I am not allowed right now to take some of my infested hemlock, even a branch, even a single little woolly adelgid and take it to Halifax to show a friend. I'm not, we're not allowed to transfer hemlock wood to other areas of Nova Scotia. We're trying our best to slow the spread. So it's actually illegal to, to take hemlock out of this zone. 
Um, you may be asking, where are the police? And that's a really good question, but we're not supposed to. So HWA has all the advantages going. It, it has two generations a year, so it's going to lay eggs. It's getting ready right now, this month, to lay eggs in the big white woolly masses that were growing over the winter months. And so uh, those will soon be hatching and then there'll be little crawlers come out and then they'll settle down at the base of the needles uh, in amongst their mothers. And they're all girls, they're all females. And then those little adelgids, and you see these little black specks here, those are new little adelgids that settle out from the second generation. Um, uh, of HWA and then they settle out and um, just kind of, uh, they don't do anything all summer long. They just, what we call estivate. They don't feed or anything. They stay that size until about mid-October and then they start feeding again. So really weird lifestyle, <laughs> life cycle, but it's, uh, they're mostly sessile and yet they're still really getting around and, um, and they're quite difficult to see in the summer. So looking for them now is about the best time of year to look now and on into the month of june and then after that things become a little less visible here's a close-up of an egg mass that was kind of tore open so you can see the the eggs inside the woolly mass and to the right is one of those cutesy little crawlers which looks like a little egg with legs and we won't be you see that that's on a hemlock needle so they're very tiny so we're not going to see them when we're in the forest unless we've got really good eyes and we're really looking for them. And so here's some of the terrifying facts. <laughs> One adelgid can start a whole new population because I didn't tell you that the female, they're all females and they don't need males to lay eggs. They're all fertile. And they, when they lay eggs, those are all fertile. They don't need to be fertilized by males. And so one HWA, one adelgid can produce 5,000 progeny in one year rough as a rough estimate you know statistics are all over the map but and if you're standing under a hemlock canopy in the spring of the year there can be a thousand crawlers or more falling on top of your head in one square meter per day so it's really important um to think about this because we won't know we won't notice these these little tiny specks falling on us so it's really important to slow the spread and I've kind of, we've kind of developed a little bit of a biosecurity checklist. And so if you can buy one of these lint rollers, you can roll that over your clothes, your hat, your knapsack, whatever you've got with you, and uh, maybe brush off your dog, your pet, and um, those will help to stop the spread. The best thing though, is to just avoid visiting multiple hemlock stands on the same day in the in the period that the crawlers are out, which is about, you know, we should think about crawlers from about mid-April to right on until maybe mid-August with the phenology seems to be all over the map, but there's, uh, we should just think about it all summer long. Uh, and the best thing to do is just, if you've been in a hemlock stand, take your clothes and throw them in a hot dryer or just wash them before you go out again. And remember your boots and your hat and things that you wouldn't more typically wash. So this really helps because, it, you know, the longer it takes for the Adelgid to reach places like Truro, Victoria Park, which is full of hemlock, the, the, the shorter period that they may have to resort to chemical control. So we're really doing everybody a favor if we can slow that spread. We're reducing the cost. So we, we started doing something about it in earnest in 2021. Uh, in October of 2021, there was a, a small group of us. We volunteered. Uh, there's a picture of some of us on the on the uh, uh, left of your screen. Uh, John Rogers, Matt Miller, myself, and Dr. Kovacs, and, and Scott Robinson. And there are two others not in the picture, Jenica Hunsinger and Mary Jane Roger from the Medway Community Forest Co-op. And together we we helped make this happen. We decided we would protect the island in the middle of Sporting Lake, Sporting Lake Nature Reserve that was infested with hemlock woolly adelgid. So uh, it was a huge effort and Nova Scotia Nature Trust needs to be thanked. I finally get a chance to thank you directly for stepping up and helping us with that effort because you helped channel the funds that were raised to buy the chemicals to, to uh, protect Sporting Lake. So a big thank you and a big shout out to Nova Scotia Nature Trust. 
uh, for managing that donor fund. And a lot of funding came in. I, you know, the Sobe family was a big donor. There were other really big donors that helped make that happen. So if, if there's anybody from the Sobe family or or another big donor out there, we I we still think about you all the time. <laughs> So, um, and then there were three of us pesticide operators, Matt Miller, myself, and Scott Robinson, that uh, oversaw the operation. And we, uh, of course, obtained full permissions from Environment and Climate Change, or Nova Scotia Environment, as they were formally called, and ensured safe work practices were in place and that everything was stringently carried out so there was no risk to the environment or to the applicators. I just want to make it clear that chemical control is never a first option. If if there were other options that were really effective, we would not be using chemical control. No one would advocate for this, but sometimes it really is the only option. And so that was the conclusion of all the, having read all the scientific literature and watched this very closely in the Eastern US, that this is, we, we knew this is what we had to do for Sporting Lake. And now we're doing it in other protected areas. But um, on the left, you can see that um, there I am putting in these canisters at the base of the tree. And they were full of eight milliliters of uh, a chemical called Imaget. There are other chemicals since that time that we are starting to use. Here's some photos of the, the fun and festivities at Sporting Lake. There was a there were over 55 volunteers that helped uh, periodically through a period of 10 and a half days. It was, we were out there a full 15, 16 days, but every night around the campfire, we had a round circle and there was a lot of laughter and cheer and sometimes tears shed because we were also very sad that this is happening to some of our best and favorite old growth forests. And so um, it was just, it was truly a magical experience. We also, uh, we, we have been through all of this back then and since that time, we've been in consultations with the Mi'kmaq and uh, learning about their perspectives and approaches to conserving hemlocks from Hemlock Valley Adelgid. Uh, and certainly Sherlyn Young from the KMK National Office and Jeff Purdy from Acadia First Nations did come and visit us at Sporting Lake and uh, uh, held a smudge ceremony, which was greatly and deeply appreciated. Uh, and that we, you know, we don't forget that we are in the land of the Mi'kmaq and that um, this is a huge, scary step in Gespuik right now. And we're, we're moving into Sebag and Agate, uh next with, with hemlock treatments and that um, we're working together with our Mi'kmaq um, colleagues to um, achieve conservation goals. So another, just another collage of Sporting Lake. And a thank you again to the Nova Scotia Nature Trust for helping lead and protect hemlocks uh, in this first large treatment initiative in Nova Scotia. And this is the treatment that then convinced uh, the government, the provincial government, that yes, we think Nova Scotians are ready to accept chemical treatment to conserve at least a very small portion of what remains of our last oldest, highest value hemlock forest. And so from that, uh, we went, we marched forward. Um, but just another factor to consider, um, hemlock is really a superior player in terms of sequestering the, the greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. Um, and we drew attention to this with Nova Scotia environment and, and climate change. And they went and got funding related to um, climate climate change funding. And so th this blue line on this graph is the carbon dioxide level that's been increasing steadily since the 1800s, really since the 1700s. And so it's crazy high now. And so this hemlock tree, uh, this tree species is, oh, there's my words, um, is just superior at storing carbon. You see on the left of the screen where I'm standing on some coarse wood, some downed coarse hemlock trunks, and they're very, they very, very slowly rot away, unlike hardwood trees do. And so they lock up that carbon for a much longer period than hardwood forests can. Uh, and they, hemlock have a longer growing season as well. You know, long after the deciduous trees have dropped their trees and they're no longer sequestering that excess greenhouse gas, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, hemlock are still trucking 
so we were injecting hemlock last year until the 7th of December on a two degree day and it was partly snowing and they were still absorbing the chemical. They were still, so they were still sequestering greenhouse gas. And so, and we know old growth forests sequester and store most of the carbon anyway. So they're very, very, they have a very important role in the climate emergency. Basically, hemlock eat carbon dioxide for breakfast. And so uh, it's important to remember that um, they're just, we need them. We've never needed them more than we do now. So if we want to prevent carbon uh, stores from contributing to more greenhouse gas, we should maintain forest cover of all sorts of forest cover, uh, but we also want to keep our hemlock alive. So this, the, it, some of those facts that inspired people like David McKinnon in this picture to, to, to apply to the Nature Smart Climate Solutions Fund and get $10 million, of which $5 million is now allocated to conserve hemlock in protected areas in Nova Scotia. So that is a, a project that I'm still um, working with uh, very hard over the winter and the spring, and it's what's going to fund our strike teams. But, a little bit more about that in a minute. Sorry, I have to keep moving the banner around. I only see Jessica and Tom, which is great to see my, my back up there, but it, it's covering my words on the screen. <laughs> so when, when, um, when we say about applying chemicals, um, there are some very valid fears out there. And I was included in that boat. Well, the first time a researcher came up from Cornell, Dr. Mark Whitmore, and he said, Donna, you're going to have to treat your trees with a chemical. I went, no way. I'm not doing it because I've just spent over 10 years studying forest songbirds and hemlock stands and I'm going to look after them first. And so I was very defensive. But it is important that we understand about the new way that we are applying chemicals, that it's not about spraying it like we see glyphosate applications on our forests. Um, it's about micro injections, about in these systemic applications, meaning that it, it goes up in the vascular system of the trees, very small targeted amounts. There isn't any direct environmental exposure with most of these application methods or very minimal. And there's a variety of products now that we can use. Um, imidacloprid is still the, the main one because uh, it's the longest acting one. It's, it is a neonicotinoid. Um, but again, it's not, um, you know, we have problems with it having been used in farming situations, killing all the pollinators, but hemlock is not a wind pollinated tree. So it's not attracting bees or pollinators. Uh, so it's, uh, this is a, an entirely different situation. And the two main uh, products with imidacloprid in them are Imaget and Zytec 2F. Those are the two main ones that we're going to hear more and more of as we deal with this um, issue down the road. There's also a product that has an, an active ingredient that's called azadiractin. I know, I don't know who makes up these names, but azadiractin comes from the neem tree and it's the neem oil from the neem seed that's, that's so it's an organic product um, and then there's, uh, so that's our only organic product. And then there's dinotefuran, which is another neonicotinoid. Both of these two are fast acting products, but they're quite expensive and they're a very short duration. So they'll go up the tree fast. They'll, they'll wipe out the HWA, which is good. Uh, but then they'll stop working rather quickly. And so hemlock woolly adelgid will come back to the tree and reinfest it rather quickly. And so uh, you will have to couple a fast acting product with a longer lasting product. So imidacloprid products will last four to seven years inside the tree. So that's the good news. We don't have to treat these trees every year. Um, they're relatively safe to use. Uh, we've done a lot of research on the non-target effects of these uh, of, of this product on, on birds, on salamanders, on pollinators, on soil invertebrates. We're doing a lot of that research right here in Nova Scotia. The Canadian Forest Service has been a huge help in leading the way in that research. And we've also got Acadia University students uh, doing a lot of research on non-target effects. And so far things, things look a lot like they did in the States, the conclusions that um, 
especially with a uh, tree trunk injection and basal bark applications, there's there is there's very little, if any, non-target effect, except we know it's going to kill everything in the canopy. And so uh, for a short while after you've treated your tree, um, there will be a die off of all the invertebrates, all the insects in the canopy. And then they will recover after two to three years uh, is what research has shown in the US. Um, so there's a trade-off, uh, but we're hoping that, you know, the other trade-off is if we don't treat them at all, the trees just die. They die and they take all the species that are living in the forest with them. So, um, yeah, the non-target, Elizabeth McCarty in the States is doing a lot of research on the non-target impacts and says the concerns originate mainly from soil applications. They do a lot of soil drench applications there. So if you do any reading on uh, the effects of, of imidacloprid products, just be aware, you have to look at the methods because uh, in the US, mostly they're, they're, they shake up a little Nalgene bottle, they kind of make a little milkshake thing. They'll make a moat underneath the tree and then they pour it into the soil directly underneath the tree and then they cover it up. Uh, and so, uh, of course, that that that's leads to greater environmental exposure. It is a very effective way, but it's it's not what we're doing in Canada. And a reminder that you may already be using imidacloprid, and you just haven't realized it because you didn't read the fine print on your Canine Advantix or your um, Advantage Fifty Five packet. But imidacloprid is in there, and it's at a whopping nine point one percent imidacloprid, or 8.8% percent imidacloprid, and you're using it about once a month. Those little drops on the backs of your on the back of your dog or your cat. Whereas Imaget is only five percent imidacloprid, and you use it every four to maybe seven years, um, five sort of as an average. So everybody's been wondering what, how can you use it on your pets, right? And how can this be good for my pet? But it's a neurotoxin that only affects insects, and so we mammals, humans, dogs, cats, mammals, as well the birds, we don't have the same neuroreceptors as insects do. So the, this imidacloprid product, as well as dinotefurin, they're designed to, to lock into the neuroreceptors of insect neurology. And so we're just, it just doesn't work on us. And so that's why it works on your dogs. They're fine, but the ticks on their back or the fleas <laughs> die. So um, we're pretty grateful for that. Well, what about the birds though? So I think I've just probably answered your question if you had that, is um, it, it doesn't affect the neurology of birds. They would have to eat a massive amount of it. And even then in those situations, uh, where they have like starlings or something eating seeds that are coated with it in the soil, um, they they will uh, stop eating for a while, they'll lose their appetite, they may get disoriented and migrate the wrong way, which isn't good, uh, but it's a very indirect effect and they do recover um, from the effects. So uh, we there's been some research, I put some research papers up here for you to that you could investigate, but we know that songbird insect insectivores in the canopy, like the Blackburnian, one of my favorite uh, warblers, um, they they're they're not they're not adversely affected basically. And remember, they're often eating live insects that are twitching. The movement catches. It. So if if they're dead, they fall into the ground. And these are you know the Blackburnian gleans insects from high in the canopy. Um, anyway, no one's more attached to for songbirds than than I am. So um, anyway, they 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 will be they will be fine. And so I, the best thing we can do for these birds, these neotropical migrants, is to protect their habitat um, because that's the biggest effect: is um, die dead hemlock everywhere are going to uh, probably kill more birds indirectly than trying to conserve some of the hemlock forest. But basically, we don't want to be using chemicals and we certainly don't want to be treating trees forever. So we want to integrate chemical control with biocontrol. And there is help on the way. There's a teeny tiny little beetle called Larry Cobius. We call him little, little Larry. And he's smaller than, than the ladybird beetle or the ladybug that you, that you see out there. And then there's a teeny tiny silverfly as well. We need two 
biocontrols because remember I said there's two generations of HWA. Well, little Larry doesn't stick around for the second generation of hemlock woolly adelgid when when they hatch out. So we need somebody to eat the second generation, and we're hoping it's the silver fly that will take care of it. And so they are. Um, so chemical control is only a short term solution. We hope to be not doing this for very long. And then the longer term solution is biocontrol. Which I should also add, biocontrol can still sound very scary. So I hope I'm not scaring everybody and putting people off on this presentation because we're, yeah, it's a dire situation, but these are, um, we, we really have some solutions here with this invasive pest. And so these biocontrols that we're testing are on the West Coast of Canada already, and are also found in the West Coast of, of the US. And so they're they're already native to a certain extent. And so um, and they're already they've already been tested for a number of years in the eastern US and they're being released in the eastern US um, as we speak. And so uh, does does chemical control really work? Well, yes, it does. Here's a tree in 2010. That's what it looked like. And in 2016, after receiving imidacloprid treatments, uh, it recovered. Now, it still doesn't look great. And so the take home message there is don't let your tree decline that much because right now in Nova Scotia, if your tree looks like that one in 2010, you're probably going to have to use both the fast acting chemical and then the longer acting imidacloprid chemical. And so that's going to increase your costs significantly. You're better to start treating early and you really want to keep your trees looking healthy. And so that that tree on the right is never going to look as glorious as it once did. So early detection is key for early intervention. So search for HWA while you're out hiking or cutting trees or whatever, if you're in the forest. And right now it's really a, a nice time of year to check for fallen branch tips. Uh, there's a lot of fresh fallen tips from winter ice storms and uh, freezing rain events and wind storms. And look for the white wool on the underside of each branch tip. And um, as I say, early intervention is, is faster and, and cheaper. And um, I can't read this. Uh, yeah, report your HWA. So take a photo if you can, if you've got your smartphone with you. Uh, if you do iNaturalist, submit it to iNaturalist or email it to this email address, hwa at novascotiahemlock.ca. If you forget those addresses, then go to Nova Scotia Hemlock Initiative. It's there. Or let Tom know on Forest Giants. And he's he's been wonderful at directing people when they, they don't know what to do uh, with his social media group. He's, he's really been helping us a lot. And um, if you can, you can take a magnifier with you, uh, hand lens, and that'll really, so you can examine HWA up closely. That's uh, always useful. And as I say, uh, good old Google, you can always Google Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, maybe add Nova Scotia and you'll get to where you need to go. Uh, we do have a Nova Scotia Hemlock Initiative site. So um, we also have the, some information that will be on the Midway Community For Forest Co-op site. And then we have copied from the Nova Scotia Hemlock Initiative site, we've copied that most of the work from the New York State Hemlock uh, Hemlock Initiative, and as well, Hemlock Restoration Initiative out of North Carolina is a very good site. So there's, there's lots of information out there. Um, so you're probably wondering, so what, well, what do I do? What do I do if I've got hemlock on my land or I've, it's in my favorite hemlock grove, what do I do? Well, um, you've got to evaluate your, um, you've got to monitor your trees and you useful, there are two really useful metrics um, that you should watch for um, before you think about treating is first of all, well, is hemlock, is HWA present? Are there, do you see egg sacs? Is there new growth on your tree? And you, it's harder to tell right now until the new growth flushes for this year, but watch for this in June, you'll have a flush of new growth. It'll look sort of this lime green color here. Um, but as well, I include this diagram where you see that just the new growth is usually got a full set of needles. It looks healthier. Um, the old growth will look a bit tattered. Um, and as well, we we use a canopy density chart and you can just 
print one of those off and then stand underneath your hemlock tree out from the trunk just at arm's length and then look straight up into your canopy and see which one of those circles best matches the amount of light coming through the foliage of your hemlock canopy. And it, it really just takes a second to learn how to use this. And we're really looking for not wanting your hemlock canopy to fall below 65% canopy density. So it doesn't take long to thin because the, the hemlock will start dropping its needles. It doesn't take long until you've suddenly got a canopy density of 65% or lower. And, you know, if you have it lower, you can still try to treat the trees, but you may not be successful. So this can change very quickly. And so it's to keep an eye on your trees and make sure that um, you are seeing new growth flushing in the spring and that your canopy density is staying nice and high. So uh, when I'm just going to practice with you here, this is a hemlock, uh, hemlocks at Pollard's Falls, and it takes a little while to develop the eye. So practice with me here. Uh, you look straight up and you see these branches and there's no needles on those tips. That's really bad. So there's that tree has lost its new growth. And then the next you'd use this chart and you'd go over to the trunk, stand underneath and look straight up through the canopy and see what kind of density does it have. And so these trees are thinning very quickly. We have developed a treatment decision key just so that we can help land guide land managers and owners to avoid waiting too long to treat their hemlocks. Um, it is out for revision right now. I think you can still access it on the Medway Community Forest Co-op site but um we're we are um it's kind of fixing it up and it'll be out soon for everybody to use uh they can take this out into the forest and actually score it it'll help guide you into deciding whether you have trees that are worthy of treatment or just they're looking pretty deteriorated and you'd have to treat with caution and so on so it will be out there to help help people through the decision process it was the result of last winter's work uh, that I, I, I did in collaboration with Dr. Sweeney and Mark Whitmore and at Cornell and others, other experts. Um, we also produced this, um, this report on treatment options. Um, it's really just a report that we wrote for environment and climate change. Um, and so without leafing through the report, which isn't really available, I don't think, for the public yet. I'm hoping it will be, though. Um, uh, the outcome of that was really take immediate action to conserve a network of healthy, high-value hemlocks across Nova Scotia. That was the advice of Dr. David Moselle in eastern uh, U.S., who's a land manager for the whole eastern U.S. Um, he just said, you should, like, pick your best forest stands and conserve this network of healthy high value hemlocks because the biocontrols, those little beetles and silver flies will need food sources to, to, you know, if the food source HWA crashes in one area, it can move to another stand. So it needs this network to sustain it. Um, and that we definitely wanted a comprehensive chemical control program and needing uh, to get the chemical tools that, that we need. And we need to start a biocontrol grant, biocontrol program immediately. And it, it still hasn't really begun yet in Nova Scotia. And the longer it takes to get that going, the longer we have to be on chemical control supports. And another good idea that I got from the US when during my interviews was they're using strike teams. So guess what, folks? We're going to be using strike teams. We started last fall, and so this spring, DNR or DNRR, I guess as they're called now, are used, they're training up two strike teams and I'm training up a strike team at the Medway Community Forest Co-op and we're going to tackle this issue and we're helping, we want to also deploy an army of volunteers and so we're, we're setting up the, uh, the um, Hemlock Heroes program and we're hoping that maybe some of you will sign up even after tonight's talk. And so the vision is really and this is written, I wrote this in the report, is that we want to we want to show some leadership here. Uh, we want the government to show leadership by enabling us to protect these high value stands so that future Nova Scotians will admire shady, dark hemlock forests. 
you know, seven generations from now in keeping with the Mi'kmaq thinking, uh, we want to make sure that there's hemlock on the landscape. So how are we gonna do this? Well, hemlock has, is the HWA infestation is more advanced in the five southwestern counties, this red zone. So we call this the area of rapid intervention. This is where we need a strike team right away to go in there and check what, what forests are really going down very quickly and they need help right now and deploy the strike teams in there to really tackle that. We need another strike team on the leading edge front where the HWA has just moved in to Kings and Lunenburg County. And then in the green area, we wanna do some more outreach and education. And in the blue zone, we wanna build awareness because HWA is coming. And so we want three strike teams minimum is what I suggested, and we will have our three strike teams. Um, but I was also thinking that one of those three strike teams would be deployed to uh, work the rivers because of those important riparian hemlock zones. So I'm thinking that it's a network of hemlock. You think of these little green dots across the, province uh, would be the conserved hemlock stands. And then the blue little squiggly lines are, are rivers that would connect these the network um, so that H the, the, the biocontrols can move up and down the hemlock stands from one area to another. So yeah, uh, so we, we uh, you know, just an example of Nova Scotia and all of the streams and rivers and lakes that we have. So it's a I think I've got a valid thinking thought process there that we should have someone, uh, a group looking at riparian strike, uh, forming a riparian strike team. There isn't one right now. Uh, we do have some interest from the Atlantic Salmon Federation, Canoe Kayak Nova Scotia, but all of this is gonna take funding and organizing and we're not there yet, but let's keep trying. So I just pointed, this is uh, Round Hill Brook, a brook not far from my house, like five minutes away. And that hemlock tree that I pointed to, it's already too late to save that one. It's looking yellow, it's chlorotic, and it's too thin to really save at this point. Uh, Sally Steele, picture of her here, uh, has been working really hard through environment and climate change. And she's prioritizing the sites that we wanna treat uh, in protected areas. And so it's a long list and it's a growing list, but here's some of the sites that we intend to treat if, if we're not too late when we arrive. Here's an example of uh, a picture from the training day that we gave last fall when we were testing out our strike teams for the first time in October and uh, trying to just get, get all the uh, operational gear in order and learn how to do this. Um, and so I played a role in um, training up what I had learned about treating trees, injecting them. There we've got um, uh, someone injecting uh, a tree there with the drill and um, people learning how to um, put on the canisters. Uh, and so our Midway Community Forest Strike Team, here's some pictures from last fall of us uh, we held two volunteer days. We had 22 volunteers come out and inject uh, 230 trees one day. And um, uh, I don't know how I've worded that now, but um, anyway, in a total of a full day, like four hours one day and four hours and, and the next, it was a pretty substantial amount of trees and, and numbers of centimeters of diameter that we had, uh, that we had uh, treated. And we also held some demonstration days um, and had participants come out. What we learned was that volunteers really want to save old growth. Um, Nova Scotians really want to save old growth. And these people, th these are examples of some of the people that came out in the picture uh, last fall, pictures. Uh, they come from many walks of life. They can be retired people. They're weekend warriors. They're folks from Halifax. They're uh, NSCC students, they're, you know, university, high school students. They, they're all ages, all sizes. Uh, there's no standard. We welcome everybody. And so we really have just begun to launch this Hemlock Heroes volunteer program. And we've already got people signing up. And um, I've got the email that you can send me or you can contact Tom and we'll, we'll get you signed up if this is something you would like to do this year. And here's just some examples of uh, 
here I was looking at uh, productivity of how many trees can we inject in a day. And we, with the aid of volunteers, we can treat 200 to 300 trees in one day with a novice crew that doesn't have any, any previous skills. Um, you can get the skills pretty quickly. And so this is the hope um, that we speak of. You know, Sporting Lake, we treated 10,000 centimeters diameter breast height. Uh, like we have to measure our trees, the, the uh, diameter at chest height, 1.3 meters from the ground. And that's our how we figure out our productivity. But um, we treated basically all 15 hectares of Sporting Lake in 10 and a half days. And so, and Berwick Camp, an amazing experience, about 10 hectares there. We treated that whole camp in four days. And so we can do this. Um, we just need to uh, uh, find faster ways to do the tree marking. And we can't actually do this without volunteer support. So I mentioned the little biocontrols. I just want to show you that help really is on the way, that this is a map from this site, um, which I can't see anymore because it's covered by these banners, but uh, the HWA predator database. And so the, this is where there have been releases of predators and then they've actually found them. They've successfully overwintered. And so um, that means they're thriving on their own now and they're able to multiply. And so they're not that far from us, but they'll, we'll need to bring them here through uh, some controlled releases and allow Canadian Forest Service to um, help guide us with that. Uh, just saying, we're trying to do this faster, 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 uh, because this is a race. Uh, Tennessee keeps reminding me, the Tennessee strike team that I've been speaking with, they keep saying, Donna, this is a race. You're not protecting individual trees. You're trying to conserve stands, whole stands of hemlock. And you you need to just keep going the fastest way you can. Uh, don't spend a lot of time tagging trees, marking trees. Uh, maybe just think about using a dot of spray paint uh, because this is all very temporary, just for 10 years, 15 years, we hope. And so the, the paint will wear off eventually. And so um, we also were testing tree planter bags to see if that could increase our speed. So um, just as one last take home, uh, which I think is most important to remember is if we lose our old growth, once we've lost an old growth hemlock stand, we will never get it back. Um, so they've never looked as nice as they do today. And once, if we allow them to slide and decline, we're never gonna get them back. Um, and so unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And so um, I thank each and every one of you for uh, listening in tonight. Um, I do have my contact email there if you'd like to become a Hemlock Hero. And for those of you who were really looking for more guidance on what do I do on my woodlot? How do I even start to tackle this? I do have a couple of more slides, but I wanted to <laughs> For some of you who just you've gotten enough, it's okay if you want to if you want to leave or jump or ask questions now and then jump off. But I I do have some extra information for those of you that may be looking for a little bit more. So that's that's it. Thank you very much. I can look at the chat, but I know Tom's been watching that. I always put the decision. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Donna, for that informative presentation. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you um, on behalf of the no Nova Scotia Nature Trust and uh, everybody who's here today. We did get a few good questions that Tom answered in the chat. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to jump in there right now. Um, I'm going to actually, Tom, would you be interested in in reading these questions out loud? Sure. Yeah, by all means. Awesome. Um, can you hear me? Can I start now? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Okay, so um, Chris asked a question about can you use stem injection up the trunk but below bottom branches? I'm thinking of vandalism where public are removing the injectors. Say it was in a public or a municipal park. Um, and the response, correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, but uh, 
Uh, what I said was that those little canisters, typically it takes, you know, 30, 30 minutes for them to unload, depending on how thirsty the tree is and how, how quickly the, the chemical is moving into the tree. But by the end of the day, all of those canisters would be removed. So there wouldn't be anything hanging around that would be um, uh, subject to, to vandalism or anything else that would happen in a park. Um, Yes, you, you wouldn't be allowed to walk away and leave them. And actually, they, they, they go in about 10 to 15 seconds. The canister can be emptied. <laughs> Sometimes it takes 30 minutes, but usually it's very rapid. So you're, you're taking them off almost as fast as they've gone on the tree. Yeah, uh, another question was, um, so you get five to seven years of active control after the injection. And, um, you know, the... the you alluded to it in your in your presentation. Um, um, you, you know, it's it's an it's an average. We, we you know so you really you can't walk away. You're going to have to monitor the trees just to see you know how they're doing. That uh, uh, that you know keep an eye on them just to make sure that uh, the bugs are staying away. We we hope it's five to seven years, but uh, you'll have to. Keep an eye out just to make sure that we're they're, they're, they have responded well to the treatment and that uh, uh, you know they continue to be protected from from any more HWA infestations. Um, did you? Yeah, have any I would say I would say for for the first four years, there's no worries. Like sometimes you can notice a branch that might have gotten missed because the vascular tissue didn't flow up with any of the product to a particular branch, but for the most part, you'll have good coverage. And the labels, the label for the injectable says four years, uh, but we're hoping that's the minimum, that it's the, it's the, it's the basil bark spray that they keep saying it's five to seven and um, years. And so we don't really know how long the injection will last or any of them, but we know we're going to get four years for sure. It's probably though five to seven years. That's where yes. you're right, Tom. We have to monitor a little bit after that and see when is the right time to re retreat. You know, just to put it into some perspective, like we've only known that this bug has been in, in Nova Scotia for six years. So, so even if we had started treating, um, the first year it, we even knew about it, we would just now be seeing if it was lasting seven years. And, and, and by, by some measures, we're a little bit behind the game. You know, we, we've, you know, really until Sporting Lake got underway, we were perhaps uh, <clears throat> not quite sure how, how the whole pesticide story was going to show up. So we're, we're making up for some, some lost time. Um, Braden had a question about biological controls and what was the status of implementation here in Eastern Canada. And um, again, you're welcome to jump in, Donna, but what I said was it's just early days. We're just starting to acquire the beetles from the West Coast, and we're hoping that there'll be trials this fall. Um, the good news, I think, is that uh, New York State have been doing this for many years and have had really, really good success, and, and, and they've been just, you know, just incredibly uh, helpful and cooperative with with us and our efforts so you know we've got we've got a, a good solid um, you know backstop helping us with our efforts here but but having said that it's going to take a while for biological controls to get underway I mean assuming things work and they you know there's a, there's many hurdles for us to get to a point where it's making a meaningful impact on on HWA, which is really why the pesticide control is, is necessary to protect those trees until the biological controls are fully functioning. Um, did you want to add anything else, Donna? I think you covered it. Yeah. Ah, well, thank you. Um, and the uh, Chris asked a question about federal or provincial funding to help cover the cost of the stem injections. And um, you know, I the point that I made was the federal government kicked in ten million dollars for climate change, of which five million was earmarked for uh, for hemlocks. <clears throat> Having said that, five million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but um, uh, when you start looking at you know how many trees have to be 
treated and that a lot of those trees are on um, provincial properties, which are the ones that the provincial government are prioritizing. Um, from my perspective, from what I'm seeing as a private woodlot owner, I think the only funding that we'll see at the private woodlot owner at this stage anyway, is through um, community outreach, training, that sort of thing. It'll be up to individuals to find their own way to, um, to uh, find the funding to treat the trees. One of the side notes that I made to uh, Chris is that um, early days, but we have a community group because we have a, a very large stand of hemlocks in the community where we live. And we're trying to put a community response together to treat those trees. Now, the very early days, we're not sure how that's going to pan out. We've got lots of enthusiasm and lots of questions. So, um, you know, but 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 as a community, we're trying to come together because we feel it's important to save these trees. And 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 I fully expect part of that is going to be fundraising as a way of paying the bills because this isn't it's it's not cheap it, it, you know somebody's got to kick in some money to pay for the chemicals well there there is a there's a couple of things to consider there um you know uh, i i do find that the the provincial government really should be considering uh finding a way to uh fund some treatments on private land certainly we just had a blowdown and you know we had a terrific a horrific hurricane event in eastern central and eastern Nova Scotia and certainly there were funds allocated to help those landowners uh, um, clean up although I would say there are ecological uh, values to to blowdowns but hey, there, there were funds allocated and so and you know there's been funds allocated to spruce budworm damage in the past and so um, but one of the things that we've got to consider is that you know, uh, the, out of this current $5 million, they would like to help private landowners more. Uh, and one of the ways they were planning to do that was through the Working Woodlands Trust, which were trying to get uh, eligible body status so that it can can be a, a real uh, legal entity and you can establish a Working Woodlands Trust on your land. And that makes it safer for uh, the the province to invest in your hemlock trees if you have it. If you have hemlock trees and you got uh, some funding from the government to have those trees treated, and then 10 years later you die, sadly, uh, but, but it is a sure thing that we're all going to die eventually, But and that land goes to someone else um, and they decide to cut all the trees down, um, then that was a waste of provincial money. So of course the province is going to try to be careful and spend money on trees that are actually going to be there in perpetuity. And so the best way we know how to do that is if you were to join a conservation uh, easement or get this working woodlands easement uh, underway, um, except that the working woodlands easement has been really slowed down because it can't seem to get its eligible body status. So anyway, that, that is a problem. But there are other ways that we're hoping to help, like supply the injection equipment or like the applicator equipment if, there, if people want to do basil bark spray. Uh, so, or, or at least help people get a, maybe an easier process to get a pesticide operator certification. So there are some things that, um, there's some additional things that we we're really trying to do because Yes, private landowners, uh, they, they do, they, they merit some assistance, in my mind. I'd just like to add to that, that uh, the Nature Trust does, you know, work with landowners to create easements on their property. So um, that can be an option if you are, you know, considering that as a long-term option for yourself. Yeah, that, that makes it then a sure bet that uh, we we are, uh, because I'm in this program now, uh, trying to work with this $5 million and, um, you know, that's what's funding the Medway Community Forest Co-op strike team and volunteer effort. Uh, but there, there's certainly the, the government, the provincial environment and climate change uh, protected areas branch would like to treat trees on private lands, but it needs some kind of guarantee. 
that those trees are protected. And so how do you do that if it's not through an easement? Yeah. I've just had a whole bunch of new questions that have come in. I'll um, just kind of go through them quickly. Um, Donna, this is a good one for you. Uh, where HWA was first found in Nova Scotia, what kind of regeneration has taken place? I.e., how has the forest recovered? Any any comments on that? Um, I've been planning to go back to the area of Quinnan, uh, Springhaven. Springhaven was like the very first place in Yarmouth County where we where it was found, and I have not gotten back there. Um, I do know that in the eastern U.S., uh, for what they what they were recommending there and advising landowners was that uh, to not clear cut a hemlock stand when they realize they have HWA. To it, they got better regeneration if the hemlock forest then if they weren't going to treat it, that it just died more slowly with the HWA infestation. And what came up underneath of it was black birch. Uh, that's Betula lenta, but black birch looks very much, very similar to our yellow birch here in Nova Scotia. And so um, having yellow birch grow up, uh, it makes sense because it's a tolerant hardwood. It, it was a tolerant stand, so that's probably more like the seed, the seed sources that would be around. Um, if you clear cut it, well, first of all, then you don't know if you had any HWA resistance because you've just cut the stand before it's fully dead. But worse than that, <laughs> worse than maybe having possibly cut out uh, your resistant trees, or maybe it's not worse. But anyway, they got a big prolific growth of raspberry bushes and brambles, all the all the stuff that you find, the diversity of, of sort of weedy species that you find in a post clear cut landscape. And so really recommend that you know, you leave it go naturally. But what's in there down in Quinnan? Well, I'm not sure because I haven't gone down. It's also going to depend on what the deer population is like. Because if you can keep the deer population out or low, it's not going to eat all the yellow birch and sugar maple and red maple that want to come up. So that would be um, that would be a very good <laughs> mitigation measure. Eat eat your problem there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd just like to mention, uh, we have some properties in that area, the Quinnan area, and they were just assessed the other day, assessed the other day. Um, the hemlocks are in very poor condition, but there was actually a little bit of new growth. So <laughs> it definitely still remains to be seen whether there will be any significant amount of forest regeneration at, at that site. Um, but like I said, there was a little bit of new growth reported. So new growth of hemlock? I'm optimistic mean? about that. Yeah, yeah. No, but don't, 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 don't be up. <laughs> I hate to say it. I should never say don't be optimistic. But um, <laughs> that's what happens is they'll, they'll, they'll hit a hemlock stand really hard. And then the HWA kind of runs out of food. And so the, the population that's crashes. Great. And then the trees kind of come back for a little while. But then they get the second wallop of HWA. And they, there's, there's really no... There's, there's still, <laughs> there's no hope for the hemlock there, but forest will grow back. There, there will be something grow on the site. We just, I'm just saying it would probably hasten it quite a bit if there, if it wasn't being heavily browsed, which I don't know if it is or not in that area. I mean, given the density of HWA surrounding, it would be very easy for those populations to, the HWA, HWA populations to rebound um, on that new growth. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of, um, you know, I had, a, I had a gentleman in Bear River uh, call me on the phone three years ago and said, it, Donna, it's a miracle. Uh, my dead hemlock or nearly dead hemlock are now all full of green, new growth and I had read that this would happen. I hadn't seen it yet, but I had read that this is what happens. And uh, today it, it wasn't a miracle. <laughs> His hemlock are, they're pretty well all dead. It's well over 95% mortality in Bear River. Very, very depressing to go to Bear River these days. Truly. 
Um, Even though it's my favorite town. <laughs> uh, do we still have time for, there's just a couple of more questions. Can I just read those off? Yeah, sure, why don't you? Thanks, Tom. Okay, so um, Bob was asking if a tree is too small for injection, how long does spraying last and remain effective? Um, and this, um, this goes back to the basal bark spraying and the fact that it 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 it, it seems that it lasts longer than an injection. So what we're what we're hearing is five to seven years for the uh, for the basal bark spray. Donna, when you guys did to Sporting Lake, did you spray or I guess you didn't do any basal bark spray at uh, at Sporting Lake? But have you have you yeah. have you had experience treating smaller trees doing it with basal bark spray? Yes, I have. Um, and um, certainly I, I, I didn't have time, I didn't take time tonight to emphasize the virtues of basal bark spraying, but there's a lot of, you know, it's a, we're using large droplet sizes, you're only spraying from 1.3 meters, you know, re roughly chest height down to the base of the tree. And so there's no drift or, you know, it's all going on the tree trunk, it's not going throughout the, the forest. And, um, but, you know, we're on the label for Imaget, the, the chemical that you inject, it says that you can't inject a tree smaller than 15 centimeters of diameter. And the label is the law. So I'm technically not allowed to inject small trees, but it's also there for the valid reason that it's just very damaging on the tree if you're drilling this tiny tree. Sure. But, so basal bark spray, though, is is um, that is the chemical on its label. It it does. It says it lasts for five to seven years, and so it's the same active ingredient as the one you inject inside the trees. But you can treat trees a lot faster and a lot more cheaply. It's about a third the price of. Imaget. And so, uh, you know, uh, certainly I'm I'm getting ready to go back to Berwick camp this spring and basal bark spray the smaller trees there. Uh, there's a limit in how much you can spray per hectare each year. And it's about, you know, it's almost a two liter milk carton, really. Uh, it's 1.9 liters that you're allowed to put on a hectare size piece of land. They just, the pesticide regulatory agency doesn't want a lot of this product in the environment. Uh, and but it's it's got its it's definitely got its advantages in that it's just fast, cheap, and uh, lasts a long time. It technically should be lasting longer than the injectable. Actually, that's a very good lead into um, the last question that I have here, which is, um, and I'm, I'm not sure how you want to deal with this, Don. If this is something that uh, you feel comfortable talking about, but. Um, Chris asks, he says, he says, where we would be treating thousands of trees within HRM. Do you know what, do you know what the cost per tree would be? And do you want to do, this is a question that always comes up, you know, like, show me the money. What's it, what's it going to be? Um, do you feel comfortable giving some indication of what costs might be for treating trees? Yeah, I, I was going to show this slide just that, um, you know, the cost is driven by the diameter of the tree at 1.3 meters high uh, because that determines how much chemical it gets. And so if you're if the diameter of your tree is one meter across, like it's a hundred centimeter diameter tree um, at chest height, then it's it's going to take a lot more. It's going to cost more than a little tiny tree. Um, and so. Uh, what you need to do uh, is, sorry, I still can't see my slides, is, you know, what you what we'd have to do in Halifax or in your woodlot even is say, how many centimeters in diameter or diameter breast height, the foresters call it DBH, diameter at breast height, do you have to treat? How many centimeters do you have to treat? So you have to go out there and you know, here's a photo on the right. You take either a diameter tape or just take a measuring tape, and then you're going to have to remember your high school math. That's probably junior high math, but I, I'd forgotten it. You know, pi r squared, remember? So 
if you measure the circumference of the tree, you can figure out what the diameter is, right? With a simple mathematical calculation. And so measure the diameter, you need to measure the diameter of each tree at 1.3 meters of height. And then you tally those up and then you'll, you'll have um, the total centimeters of, and, and so for instance, uh, Imaget, the, the treatment that we treat, it's 1.6 milliliters of Imaget that you'll need per centimeter of diameter of tree. So if you know the cost of your chemical, you go, okay, uh, I need to know like, how much is it for one milliliter of chemical? So 1.6 milliliters times, uh, you know, if you have a big tree, 100 centimeter tree, you multiply that and you've got the total amount of chemical you need. And then you gotta know how much is your chemical? Uh, you know, how much does it cost to buy that? So, um, but that's the start. The start is everything is determined by diameter of the tree. Hopefully okay. that ends. Yeah. And um, that was it for the questions that I came in through the chat and the question and answer. Does anybody else have anything else that they would like to ask at this point? They're probably pretty tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we did have another question come in though. Oh, <laughs> thank you all. Great information. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to all of the attendees who stuck around an extra half hour to get a little bit more information. Uh, really appreciate you know, your interest in HWA. Um, we Tom had put a link to Hemlock Heroes, uh, previously mentioned by Donna, in the chat. Definitely feel free to um, click through that. If you're interested in supporting this more, the Nature Trust will be doing a lot of work with Hemlocks this upcoming year as well. So if you're interested in supporting um, any of the work that you've heard about today, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Donna's provided her contact information. Uh, Tom's was in the Q&A as well, um, which was giantsofnovascotia at gmail.com. And then I'm jessica at nsnt.ca. So thank you everyone very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks for your interest. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.